It's very good to see all of you here for our um, fourth SEF's uh, public lecture, I believe. We've been going, presenting these uh, events on an almost annual basis to try to stimulate a conversation about the issues of the food system and about the issues of sustainability and about all of the great things going on here in North Carolina that we can learn from, uh, from each other. And over the years, we obviously have learned that they relate to food and to production, but then also to beginning farmers and to youth and to what's called ag literacy, understanding things about our food systems. And then ultimately some of the questions related to policies and to uh, the things we need to know about that really do impact our food systems. Um, my name is John O'Sullivan, and I'm one of the directors of SES, very honored to be in that position. I am a faculty member at North Carolina A&T State University up in Greensboro. And ourselves and NC State and the North Carolina Department of Agriculture have been collaborating for almost 20 years, since 1994, um, under an umbrella that we call CEFS, the Center for Environmental Farming Systems. And uh, the, on the one hand, that is a place, that is a 2,000-acre research facility down in Goldsboro, where we're working on a variety of topics that are relevant in terms of uh, modern production systems that are sustainable, that are systems that integrate uh, feed and, and livestock and, in fact, harvesting the sunlight that pours down on us uh, so often and so bountifully. So that we have been honored to be involved in the actual production and working with farmers. But then over the years, it's expanded. Um, and now we are in the thick of questions relating to health and to the issues of nutrition and things like that. So we are very excited to have this event. What I'd like to do just to begin is to ask you to make sure your cell phones are turned off or in a silent mode. If your stockbroker needs to connect with you, you know, as to uh, put or call or any of those things that, that sometimes matter. Um, so uh, just uh, as a courtesy to all, if you would just uh, attend to make sure that cell phone is turned off or in a, in a uh, silent mode. We will have questions and answers, but rather than trying to shout them out or, or organize that here, we've got, I think everybody's been given a little piece of paper or a note card. Uh, jot down your um, questions and we will have people collecting them toward the end of the actual event and uh, read from them and make comments uh, is the way that Maya has been, uh, did it this morning in Goldsboro with our event down there. Um, we are very, happy to have had a number of uh, sponsors and partners to help make this event possible. Our special thanks to our lead sponsor, Compass Group, who has been committed in terms of their programs, in terms of the things they do as a, as a um, food service provider, and in partnering with producers and processors and ourselves uh, in the state. So Compass Group, very strongly appreciated. Um, Special thanks also to the planning group. Uh, I know there are people here who helped plan this event. Charlotte and is Santos here, or Taz. Uh, others who participated in, in the planning of this. We really appreciate the work that we have been involved in because we are dealing with a very important question of diversity and of justice and of equality and equity in our food system. All of those matter fundamentally and we appreciate you and Tess and uh, Lisa Forehand and others who helped make this event happen, so thank you. Um, and very definitely, very definitely. What I'd like to do now is just um, ask some people to stand, and if we all hold our applause at the end, we can, uh, hopefully everybody will be standing I, I, if I made my list, um, but, and just give everybody a round of applause really of, of appreciation. Um, I'll, we have a board of advisors that is very instrumental in helping us to work and I'd like to ask members of the CEFS board uh, to please stand. Um, Alex? Yes. Thank you. And, and hold, hold, we've got, uh, 
We've, I know we've got some political leaders. I know we've got a representative of um, Senator Hagan's office here, if I'm not mistaken. Thank you, sir. Um, and other political leaders, Eva, obviously Eva Clayton, a retired uh, congressperson. So anybody else? Uh, yes, we've got others. Um, we've got perhaps members of, of North Carolina state agencies. I don't know if anybody, the Department of Agriculture or Commerce or any of the others who are partners with us in these questions. Anybody here tonight? Uh, they're members of the Local Food Policy Council um, and the Local Food Sustainable um, Policy Council. Yes, there as well. Community leaders, um, people who are here from the community, please stand, who are working together in the community to help make things happen. Um, you don't all be, here's your opportunity to stretch your legs. There you go, thank you. <laughs> nonprofit organizations. We do have nonprofit groups, LLPP, Land Loss Prevention Project, Operation Spring Plant, RAFI, CFSA, others. Are, are, you're out here, I know, there you are. Thank you, thank you for, as seeds might very well be represented, Stonehouse. We've got uh, awesome groups here across the state making things happen. Um, university leaders, students, faculty and staff, A&T, NC State, Duke, I saw someone here with an NC Central t-shirt on. Eagles are represented here. It's good to see, we got Aggies, we've got Wolfpack, we got uh, whatever the folk, the Duke, what are they called? They're, they must be here too, aren't they? Or in their home place, or at least they share it with NC Central. High school, do we have any high school students? We had, we had 400 people at a meeting at the high school in, Green, in um, Goldsboro this morning, and a wonderful event. Let's give everybody a round of applause. <laughs> and a, an appreciation for help making these kinds of events happen and worthwhile. Uh, what I'd like to do now is pass the microphone to Charlotte, who will introduce uh, Congresswoman Clayton, and then we will proceed to the speaker. So you're coming around that way? Yes. Okay, I don't know if I can do this, uh, <laughs> but I will try my best. So first of all, thank all of you for being here, Durham and surrounding areas. Um, very grateful to see all of you. Um, so we've been spending the past 48 hours or so with Maya and her team, Anthony and Simran. And um, I've honestly been like a kid in a candy store I, well, I guess that's a bad analogy if we're talking about healthy foods. So, uh, but y'all know what I mean. Uh, y'all get it. <laughs> so uh, we met leaders from around the state, particularly leaders of color from around the state, folks from um, Citizens for Change in West Southern Pines, um, Emily Chavez, a founding member of Red Uprising that's right here in Durham. And earlier this morning, we spent some time down in Goldsboro my neck of the woods, engaging and challenging high school students, and hearing stories of resilience from local residents and activists and artists. Um, Maya last night um, referred to all these amazing programs and projects as, quote, green sprouts, um, the result of seeds that were planted and nurtured over generations of growing food, saving seeds, educating ourselves and each other, and fighting diligently for social, environmental, and economic justice for all people. And I know there's a lot of people in this audience who, uh, who do that every single day. Um, we need to talk about what it is, what it needs to be, and commit to doing the work to make that happen. Um, so this is at the, the lens with which the lady who is going to actually introduce our 2013 Sustainable Ag Lecturer views her work. Um, former U.S. Congresswoman, the Honorable Eva Clayton, helped to establish national and international partnerships and alliances to fight hunger around the globe. She's a CEFS board member, and she's a graduate of, shall I say, North Carolina Central University right here in Durham. Go ahead and do it if you need to. Um, so, so it's truly my honor and my pleasure to introduce the Honorable Miss Eva Clayton. Thank you, Charlotte. Um, I hope I'm in the right spot, am I? Can you hear me? Okay. Well, 
It is my pleasure and honor to introduce Myla Weiler, an attorney, an author, a lecturer, and a policy wonk, so she calls herself. She is the founder and the president of the Center for Social Inclusion, a national organization of public policy strategy that works to unite public policy, research, and grassroots advocacy to transform structural racial inequity into structural fairness and inclusion. Wow, what a great vision. Don't we hope she's successful? That we will have structural fairness and inclusion. Prior to the founding of the Center of Social Inclusion, Myla was a senior advisor on race and policy to the director of the U.S. Program Officer of Open Society Institute and helped to develop and implement Open Society Foundation, South Africa's Criminal Justice Initiative. She has worked for American Civil Liberties Union, National Legal Department, and the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, Inc. Ms. Waller graduated from Columbia University School of Law in 18, in 18, my God. <laughs> she, is, she is universal, not that. Uh, and, and 1989, and is a frequent speaker on the national stage and author of many influential policy uh, articles. For this audience, however, we are particularly interested in her advocacy for just and sustainable food systems and social change through open forums, policy, and grassroots advocacy. We know that Myla lecture will be stimulating and thought-provoking. I am pleased to present to SELF's 2013 annual lecture, Ms. Myla Wyler. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, if you can't, you just, you know, make faces at me and uh, I'll know what that means. Um, so it, it's, it's my great pleasure to be here and I thought I should start with a question. How many of you would eat pink slime? Raise your hand. Nobody? Well, neither, one person, you'd eat pink slime? It does depend on what it's flavored or, yeah, no, any old pink slime? Oh, okay. Uh, well, so uh, neither would the students uh, in Goldsboro. And one of the things that I've learned on this trip, and I've learned many things, is the students of Goldsboro found out about pink slime being injected into the meats that were being sold in the cafeteria, um, served in the cafeteria of their schools, uh, and what the health impacts of that were. And they started organizing to make sure that their school was no longer going to serve them meat with pink slime in it. The other thing that I've learned since I've been, I, I, how many of you know uh, Mr. Joe Thompson, who is a black farmer here in North Carolina? Okay, several of you. You know, and it, we had the pleasure of meeting Mr. Thompson, I don't know, what was that, about three years ago, Ebony? Uh, and one of the things that Mr. Thompson did is he took his tobacco settlement money he was a tobacco producer, took his tobacco settlement money and figured out, uh, really figured out, nobody was around to help him. He had to do a lot of research, spent a year trying to figure it out, how he could produce prawns on his farm because they would be more environmentally sustainable. He could earn potentially more money and at the same time, uh, you know, he could have both a better life for his family and he could actually work less hard. It actually was less hard farming. And he created a viable farming business in prawn farming, selling to restaurants, growing it locally, selling to restaurants. Most of his prawns come to restaurants right here in the Raleigh-Durham Durham area. And just recently, he became the first black farmer in the state, Ebony, to get a conservation easement to protect his ability to both farm soundly and in a way that's sound for the environment, but to also keep that land 
in his family and create financing that could ensure that he could continue to do the sustainable farming he was doing. Does that sound good to you? Uh, I also met a gentleman who used to be in a gang and he's 21 years old, he has a daughter and one of the things he said last night that I, I think I want to make, I've changed my, by the way, I've changed my speech five times in the day and a half that I've been here. Thanks, Charlotte. Um, but one of the things that he said last night I really think is part of the theme for what I, I hope to impart today and I, what I hope you'll carry with you is he said, uh, one, he said, I used to be a gangbanger and now I'm manning up. And in manning up, I know I need to be a different role model to my daughter, I need to show up differently in my family, and I need to be different in my community. And the thing that got him there was the work that so many local folks and girls, including Shorelette, have done to help kids learn how to grow food and sell it. And now he is a fr fresh produce vendor from produce that he's learned to grow in his community and he's no longer gangbanging, and he's manning up. Does that sound good to you? <laughs> and I, I want to lift all this up. It, one of the things he said last night in this informal dinner we had, when people were really sharing these stories, these green shoots, what I've called green shoots, that is planting a new tree, a tree of life for communities, a tree of life for the nation, uh, to create a different food system, to create something that actually holds up communities, holds up families, holds up individuals to lead healthy lives, to have sustainable communities. One of the things that he said last night, which was probably the most poetic thing that got said in the whole evening, certainly wasn't anything I said, he said, we have to shine a light in dark places. You know, creating these green shoots in part means we have to shine a light in dark places. Uh, and so one of the things that I want to do tonight is shine a light on one of those dark places. And the reason for that is because when we shine a light on it, it's no longer dark. It's no longer scary. It's no longer a thing that we have to avoid and a problem that we must live with. It's like a festering wound. It becomes something that we can solve, right? And his own personal journey is a great example of that. One of the dark, the, the dark places I want to shine some light on tonight is how our food system is not working in some ways that were not always visible to us. And the role that race plays in that. And when I talk about race tonight, because race is one of those dark places, right? It's one of those those places we're afraid to look at, that we're afraid to go. It's a scary place, mostly because we want to do right and good, and we don't know how sometimes, and it's a hard conversation to have. Um, but one of the reasons I want to shine a light there is also because if we can't, who in this room has a race? Raise your hand. Oh, everybody has a race. So when we're talking about race, we are actually talking about all of us because we all have one. It may not have been chosen for us, we might not have adopted it for ourselves, but we do all have one. And talking about race, one of our common misconceptions is that we're not talking about all of us, but we are. We want to pay attention to the white farmer who is enslaved by a contract with a stateless corporation that will not allow that farmer to make a viable living planting fruits and vegetables. We want to shine a light on that, and I would argue that's looking at race. We want to shine a light on the fact that we have people working on farms in North Carolina, over 90% of whom are migrant and speak Spanish, and have husbands and wives conspiracy. Uh, children, children, by the way, who, children who while we have child protection laws in this country can lawfully work 
on a field who earn $11,000 a year getting food to our tables, which is not enough to feed their own families. We need to shine a light on that. We need to shine a light on the fact that in 1987, there were a mere 3,000 black farmers in the state of North Carolina. That was just emphasis. That was just emphasis. Uh, and that by 2007, there were only 1,500. We need to shine a light on that. And in shining lights on all these places and all these races, right, all of us, one of the things that we need to do is understand why is this system not really working for us? How many of you live in communities that get fresh fruit and vegetables that you can afford? Hold, hold up your hands. Proudly, because that's a good thing, right? Many, many of you. How many of you know people who live in communities that can't? Just as many. So when we think about our food system, um, Victoria in the audience asked me uh, at the reception, she said, can you define food justice? Because I would argue the food system we currently have is not a just one, right? And those examples that I just shared from the white farmer who I would argue is a sharecropper, but just a sharecropper to a corporation, uh, to the farm worker, to the community that cannot actually afford fruits and vegetables, that that's not a just food system. So what is? What is a just food system? Uh, so it's really quite simple, I think, the way we define it and the way that I think most people in the movement define it. It means that we can all actually get and eat healthy food that we can afford. It means that we can work in the food system and be able to take care of our families and that the food system itself sustains the planet, not destroys it. That's a just food system. Um, and it's an attainable food system. It's, an, it's not actually one that we cannot have. So what's going wrong? How many of you think that we've got a just food system right now by that definition? All right, I, you probably wouldn't be here if you thought we had one, okay. Um, but one of, so what is getting in the way, especially when we started with these examples of people working so hard in their communities to make really good things happen around food, right? What's getting in the way? Uh, so one of the things I said last night was that policies, policies are like the irrigation system and the fertilization of our food system. So we can either have policies that are delivering water to all parts of the system and they're fertilizing all parts of the system or we can have policies that don't and right now our policies are not fertilizing and watering all parts of the system so let me talk a little bit about why and in doing that I want to um, you know I shared the stories of the work that's that's happening right here in the state um, but I wanted to share another story. Um, this is a story of, uh, and I think it's a story of a farmer, and his name is Mr. Pigford. And Mr. Pigford is, is black. Mr. Pigford wanted to become a farmer and had a plot of land that he was going to buy here in the state of North Carolina to do that. And when he went to uh, try to get the loan necessary to buy the land, he couldn't get it. And one of the things, there were many, many things happening, and he was far from the only one, but the bottom line is the, f the public money, taxpayer money, that comes through the federal government down to local communities to support more farmers getting into farming, new farmers, small farmers, family farmers, uh, that he couldn't get a fair shake at getting access to that money, to buy his land, to farm. And this was actually a story that was happening all across the country, and particularly across the South, is that decisions were not necessarily being made in a fair way. Not everyone had fair information about how you could actually get this money. And not everyone had, fair had, had a fair opportunity to compete for this money. 
Uh, and then when people would complain to the federal government that they weren't getting a fair chance to get access to and compete for this money, the federal government would take the complaint and throw it in the trash, despite the fact that it was a public program that was supposed to serve us all fairly. And Mr. Pigford became one of the true heroes, the true 21st century heroes, who actually was willing to stand up and say, we should all get the chance to get resources to become the farmers that will provide fruits and vegetables to our friends and neighbors and create a different economy for our local communities. Why is that so important? Well, one, one of the things that we've done with our policies is that we've said, you know what, we're going to take of our $5 billion, $5 billion that we are going to spend subsidizing crops, $4.9 billion of that $5 billion will go to corn and soy. And none of it is allowed to go to fruits and vegetables. Not one penny. Not one penny. When I was in Goldsboro this morning, I asked those kids, I said, raise your hand if you have enough fruits and vegetables in your community. And less than half of the audience raised their hand. Less than half. When we look at the farmers who are producing fruits and vegetables, by the way, 38% of them are white and can't get a dime of that money. But half of all black, half of all Native American, two-thirds of all Asian farmers farm fruits and vegetables. Shine a light on race. That's not okay for those 38% of white farmers who are trying to produce fruits and vegetables. And it's certainly not okay for a much higher percentage of people of color who, by the way, would love to sell that fruit and produce locally. So, here, so that's a policy fix that could radically change what food we are subsidizing, how that contributes to meeting a, a need that so many people in our community have for healthy food, and can keep people producing on family farms. You know, in 1900, 40% of Americans lived on farms. By 2000, only 2% did. And that kind of policy can create more farmers. But it's not just more farmers, right? Oh, one other little fact. One of the other reasons why we don't see full fairness in the food system is because the way the food policy subsidy, the food subsidy works, you get the amount of money you get is based on how much land and how much production you've had over time. Half of all farm, black farmers have less than 50 acres. The average acreage for white farm is 400. 10 percent, and this works obviously against white farmers as well who have small plots of land. Right? So it's not fair for them either. 10% of farmers in this country get over 60% of our public dollars to subsidize their crops. Does that sound fair? Most of that money, by the way, the reason we subsidize corn and soy is not to feed people here. It's for an export market. Most of it goes abroad. So we have rural communities literally dying for fruits and vegetables. We're, substitute, we're subsidizing corn and soy, and we're sending it away. The way to create a, food, a just food economy, a just food system, is not only having more small producers, not only making sure that we are actually supporting, supporting those local producers to produce the foods we need that make us healthy, that we need locally, and selling it locally. 
We also need one other thing. We need more than one other thing. But tonight, we only need one other thing. Anyone have a guess what that one other thing is? What do you need to buy the food that's healthy and good for you? You need money. It costs. The healthier the food is, the higher the price. This is what we mean by justice, right? Where we live, the environment's healthy, we can get the food we need, the health care, we have jobs, we can get to where we need to go. Um, this shows you how many farmers in North Carolina are actually excluded from the subsidies. Look at how high these numbers are. White farmers, 60%, 59% in North Carolina don't get these subsidies. Uh, if you're Latino, it's 73%. Black, 49%. Asian, 90%. Native American 67. It's a lot of farmers right here in the state. Here's what else. So as a result, you know, this is a dip in black, black land ownership for farming. But notice something interesting here. Nationally, between 2002 and 2007, we did a little better. We did a little better, right? We actually got some more, in this case, black people farming. North Carolina, steady decrease. That can be changed. But some of this is about the subsidy story. But here's the real point, the, my new point. The price of food. You need money to buy food. And look at what's happening with the prices. For fruits and vegetables, between 1985 and 2007, the price has increased 40%. Does anyone know what's happening with wages in this country? At best, they're static, you know, they're stagnant. At worst, a lot of people are seeing their wages go down, right? And look at what's happening with fats. It's actually 15% cheaper. And soda is 25% cheaper than it was in 1985. So if you're watching your wages stagnate, and the price of fruits and vegetables go up. And the farmers who are producing those fruits and vegetables, disproportionately, they're going to be small farmers, white, disproportionately, they're going to be black, Native American, have to charge 40% more. What are you going to buy? You're going to buy the chips. You're going to buy the soda. Because it's what you can afford. That's not a choice. That's not a choice. So one of the ways we change this equation is raising wages. And the food system itself has some of the lowest wages of any of the jobs in our economy. Which means the people who are helping to produce the food, whether they're farmers, whether they're food processors, distributors, or whether they're on the retail sales side of this. Any of those people, most of them are having trouble buying groceries by the end of the month. One of the stories here is that when we changed our farm policy in 1996, and when we changed, we call the act, one of the acts was called the Freedom to Farm Act. Okay, hint, when acts of Congress say things like freedom, <laughs> be afraid, be very afraid. Because it usually means it's masking, we're about to do some harm to farmers, so we're going to make it sound good. And one of the things that the Freedom, freedom to Farm Act did was, it actually said, we're going to take away some of the direct payments that was supporting the prices, meaning supporting small farmers. We're going to take that away, which meant even more of the dollars went to stateless international corporations. Let me say one thing here. There is an important role for corporations in the food economy. This is not an either or. But what's happening right now is there's no balance in the food economy. 
So there's no balance between having large multinational producers and small local producers, right? And one of the things that this policy did was it pulled the rug out from under small producers and really distribute even more of those public dollars to private, to the private sector. And the reason I emphasize stateless, we have a global economy and corporations don't exist in one country anymore. But that means it, we shouldn't really think of them as citizens. They're businesses and their interests are to deliver to their investors. And that's fine. That's fine. But what we want is to make sure we're protecting a free market economy and that means that the small producer can exist along with the large producer and that we have d many many different kinds of players in the market but the reason I'm telling this story in connection with wages is one of the reasons for this is they also wanted to drive down the cost of food so these subsidies were one of the ways in which they could drive down the cost of these corn and soy and wheat. So why did they want to drive the cost down? So that people in poorer countries abroad could afford to pay for it, to create an export market. But in doing that, they were also pressing down labor costs in order to ensure that they could keep their costs down. But that meant American workers in the food economy can't afford healthy food in the American market. So here is the thing that many of us have to start realizing. And, and, and how many of you remember the story of Henry Ford? All right, and what was the story of Henry Ford around creating the automobile? What did he decide to do for his workers? He had to take their wages up so they could buy his cars. He said, who's going to buy my cars if the people on my assembly line can't? I need them to be able to buy the cars, so I'm going to pay them so that they'll return their earnings to me. And that's actually not what's happening in the food system right now. But it's a viable economic model where we say, we'll pay you more so that you can pay us more. And by the way, in paying us more, you can pay the small producer who doesn't have the economies of scale. 50 million Americans today, probably an undercount, but according to the federal government, 50 million Americans today are struggling to eat at the end of the month, at the end of the paycheck. And 40% of them are working they're working. And a lot of those who aren't are children. Are children. We have the highest, we have the, one of the highest child poverty rates of the industrialized world. And the food economy is not all of the equation, but it's a really big part of it. So, North Carolina to shine a light, as I said earlier, farm labor in North Carolina is low, significantly lower paid than in, in the national average. And that's bad, because the actual national average is really low. All right? But that means all of the North Carolina farmers who are small, that's that much less of a consumer market for their produce, for their products. I'm not going to keep with these statistics, but I want to share some hope. Uh, and I want to bring it back to the examples I shared at the beginning of the night. So Rock United is Restaurant Opportunities Center. Um, it's restaurant workers, and again, it's a part of the food system where people are not paid enough. People of color are most likely to be in the lowest paid jobs. Uh, lots of good evidence about discrimination and deciding who gets the higher paid jobs in, in, in the restaurant industry. Um, but one of the big fights they're fighting for now is paid sick days for workers in the food system. Do you know why? If you miss three days of work, you're not buying food at the end of the month. 
So if you're not getting paid for the time you need to take off because you're sick, you are no longer feeding your family, which means they go to work sick. One of the biggest problems re relating to our federal deficit is health care costs. We want to bring those costs down. We let people stay home when they're sick, and we make sure they can eat through the end of the month. But the other is, of course, the minimum wage hike. We haven't changed the minimum wage. I, went, I don't even remember the year, because I forgot. It was like, I think it was before I was born, which is really bad, because that was a while ago. Um, but the point is, we have to take the minimum We haven't actually increased the minimum wage, and the costs have been going up for over a decade. But Rock United is not just, not just thinking about the wages of the workers they're organizing. They've started to try to figure out how to connect to the struggle of the farmer. So they understand that they're the fork, but they want to make sure that they're connecting to a food system that's viable for the farmer. And that is work we should all help to bridge. The other coalition of Immokalee workers, um, when I was talking about race in Goldsboro, one of the questions I got, and I brought up the note cards from a student was, why are you so focused on racism? What is the difference between black and white farmers? Uh, so the short answer is, as humans, not a thing. In terms of how they're located in the food economy, way too many farmers are getting messed over who are white. And farmers of color are ground zero, which means if we pay attention to what's happening with them, we're going to also be able to fix the system for, for white farmers. But I want to also share an example of shining a light on race does not mean erasing white farmers. And here, the Immokalee workers is a perfect example of this. Um, farm workers amongst the most marginalized, Immokalee, Florida, wages, some of these people are earning $5,000 a year. I mean, really, I mean, it's virtual slavery at those wages. Um, but one of the things, they looked at the food system. They didn't just point the finger at the white farmer who was employing them. And what they said is, you know what? Our problem is not the farmer, the white farmer, who is not paying us Latino workers enough. Because our, that white farmer is a sharecropper for a Taco Bell. Because Taco Bell has, and not just Taco Bell, but fast food has such a big market share of the produce, the tomatoes, that Immokalee workers were picking, that they couldn't pay their workers more because they couldn't get more from the fast food chains. So the Immokalee workers, instead of organizing and pointing the finger at the farmer, they pointed the finger at Taco Bell and said, one penny, one penny more a bushel will change our lives. And you need to pay the farmer one penny more so that the farmer can pay us. That is an example of us working together to make a food system that works for the farmer and for the worker, you know, and ultimately for the consumer. Uh, because again, the more we can get those wages up, the more we get more money in the economy and the more that helps everyone. But I also want to lift it up, and I want to lift Compass up, who's here. Because as I said earlier, and I really meant this, this isn't about being anti-corporate. And rightfully, a lot of the fast food chains recognize that they had to change and that it was the right thing to do. But there were also private sector that hopped on board at the beginning and said, that's the right thing. We're going to do that, and we're going to support you in doing that. So thank you, Compass, for being one of those good corporate actors. Um, so there is a, yeah, that really deserves a hand. So, and the other word, I, I, uh, I, I, um, 
for Valentine's Day, I went to Tom Colicchio's restaurant. He has a lot in, Brook in Manhattan. Um, do you all know, how many of y'all watch Top Chef? All right, tell the truth. We're not going to look. Nobody's going to talk about you later. Okay. Well, Tom Colicchio is one of the scary judges on Top Chef. Um, he also has some of the, like, I think it's four or five of the highest end fancy luxury foofy restaurants in New York, which is really saying something. You come to Manhattan, we'll show you some foofy restaurants. Um, he has also been deeply committed to changing the food system. He's been deeply committed to making sure nobody is unable to pay for food. And he has been deeply committed to making sure workers in his restaurants are. And he is one of the restaurant owners who has signed on with Rock United and who actually publicly goes out and says, we've got to change this. So I, I want to lift those up because if we look at all the things that are happening right now, all the people who are trying to change the food system into a just one, into one that works for the white, white farmer growing tomatoes in Florida, to the black farmer trying to grow prawns, to the food processing workers working in the packaging plant, to the consumer, to the, to the retailer who's selling it over the counter, and the consumer, those of us who are buying it at the other end, which is all of us. There's so many green shoots, and the way to make sure they grow in a big, huge trees that are going to be here for 200 more years is by figuring out a way to cross-pollinate, is by creating those bridges between, as the Immokalee workers did with the white farmer, as Rock United is trying to do with the farmer, as the gangbangers who are trying to figure out how to put down their guns in Goldsboro and sell some vegetables and make sure they're feeding their community are doing, that is what we can aggregate into something that produces food we can all eat. Thank you. So we're gathering cards because we, you know, it's a big group, but we wanted to make sure there was some back and forth. There's a lot of expertise in this room. There's a lot of fantastic work that's happening right here in North Carolina. What are your questions and what are your comments? Anybody with a card, just hold it up. Come on now, the students had lots of cards. I, I can pull them out. You are as smart as a fifth grader, I swear. <laughs> so, uh, well, while we're getting cards, I, I brought two of the cards I got today from the students, and I, I, I read you one. Uh, and, you know, their questions were so good. And, and by the way, they weren't all, they were really pushing back on me, some of them, but in a really good way, and I, I was really impressed by that. Uh, but one of, the, one of the other cards that I brought why do farmers still help out in the, economy, in the economy, even though they aren't getting paid that much? And I thought, what a good question. What a good question. Uh, when I was sitting there, I, 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 after that, you know, and I, I gave my wonky answer. Um, but after that, I sat down uh, next to a woman who, who, who came to, to hear the talk in Goldsboro. And she started sharing with me her story. And you know, her story was essentially growing up here, moving north, which is the story of so many black people in this country, but growing up on a farm and loving it, and loving how it made her feel to grow the food that she could not only feed her family, but that she could take to her neighbors. Uh, and I think there's so many farmers who I've met of all races who are farming for that reason, even as they're farming to make, make a living. But they're farming because it's not because they can't get off their land and find something more lucrative to do, it's because they love what they do and they see themselves as creating a different kind of community and supporting it. Uh, how do we change the structure of land ownership? Uh, very good question and of course the history of this country is we didn't always have land ownership. 
Native people saw land as the commons and used it collectively. Uh, and then part of what we did with policy is rather than irrigate that and fertilize that, we actually started eroding that. And we started taking land from Native peoples, of course, in, and, and creating the Homestead Act where we were giving land to anyone who would meet certain conditions who generally were not people of color. Um, and even changing the hacienda system in the southwest where people had cattle grazing, right? Not penned in, grazing, and then they, they'd let them out at the beginning of the season and call them back in at the end of the season, and that was actually sustainable for the prairie land. Um, and fencing that in actually made it significantly less sustainable. So I, I want to say two things. One, again, I don't think it has to be an either or. I think what we need are multiple forms of ownership models, that whether it's farming, land ownership, uh, food production, processing, and selling. Uh, so one is, one of the ways to change the structure is to create new vehicles to how people own and hold land. Um, how they can hold it collectively in a way that still enables people to control the decision making on the land is one. Um, I'm not the, there are probably people here in this room who are much better, bigger experts on this. Conservation, conservation easements is another example of, of changing the way we own land because while we still own it, we're also committing the land to be used in perpetuity in a way that protects the land. So it's a nice public-private partnership in a way, right? Uh, in New York State, we're one of the few states where uh, the state can own land and you can have private ownership on state land so that you can actually own a chunk of land and be surrounded by forever wild forests. Um, so I do think we have some models, and as I said, it's really about s advocating for and making some of the policy changes that allow more of that to happen. What is the best way to change food policy at the federal and state level? Um, so this is where I'm going to go back to the way I ended. Uh, our power exists in changing policy, exists in working together and figuring out what our common interests are. And I don't mean interests in a narrow way. I don't mean interests in a selfish way. I mean in having a viable food economy. Um, so thinking about how we need to sustain small farmers as well as workers in the economy, bringing that together is part of how that happens. Because what's happening right now is farm organizations are going to the capital and certainly I'm speaking federally, I can't speak for North Carolina, they're going and saying, preserve this program over here. And food workers are going and saying, minimum wage, we need you to pass a minimum wage policy. And what's currently happening in Washington is that friends, friends of changing the system, but who are also trying to change and protect many things, are peeling off parts of the farm bill and saying, well, let's only deal with the subsidies because we can hold them hostage to win some other things we're trying to win as we're focused on deficit reduction. And what that does is it imperils all the other things that we are fighting for to irrigate and fertilize a better food system. And we have a choice, and I've seen it happen a million times. When we start fighting for our own little project, our own little program, Without seeing how we got to fight for multiple programs, we divide our power, we make it diffuse, and we lose. So we need an equation where we're looking at how we're saying something. And I actually um, had the privilege of living in South Africa for a while. Uh, and South Africans did this in fighting apartheid where they said, nope, we're not going to fragment. We're not going to let you offer us this one thing over here and then allowed you to trade something else off over here. And, and they even, uh, at one point in the anti-apartheid movement said, we're all black. We're all black. I mean, whether they were South Asian, whether they were white, whether they were colored, they said, we're all black now. And that was another signal that they said, you will not divide us. And we will figure out our common interests and we will fight for them together. So we are not doing that right now, but we, uh, but we see so many people starting to figure this out and try to do this, that's what we have to support and encourage. 
And when we do that, we can restore balance in the policymaking process. Because believe me, right now, it's not balanced. I would speak more, I'm not the expert on the state level, um, so I won't speak to that. Um, if the corporation inherently cares only about its shareholders and making a profit, why would it care about justice? I think there are two things. Um, some corporations commit themselves to justice as a value for the corporation. So while they may not be forced to, uh, and not all corporations are, are public, not all of them report to shareholders. So we shouldn't oversimplify the private sector. Um, and I, I think we've given examples of corporations that have really chosen to be good actors. Uh, but it's a fair point. One of the things that's skewed is if your, body, if, your, if your corporation is saying our only, our only responsibility is to the shareholder, that corporation will not be doing what's in the best interest of the country. Because the interest of the shareholder is not necessarily the same as the best interest of the country. And what I would argue is, that's fine. That's fine. But, we, but there are certain then privileges you will not have as a corporation because that's your sole responsibility. That means you don't get to say how our policy should work because you're not engaging in it in a way that's about making the nation work. You're only engaged in it in ensuring that it works for your shareholders, which is not the entire nation. You can make that judgment. And we will support that judgment. And you know you will not be treated as a citizen. One of the biggest, now you're going to give me on my law school wonkiness. One of the things that we have to understand about corporate power right now in this country is that we grew it by Supreme Court decisions, starting in what's called the Lochner era. And do you know what constitutional amendment the courts used to make corporations a citizen entitled to free speech rights that has now brought us corporations' ability to spend an, an unlimited way to lobby? The 14th Amendment. You know what the 14th Amendment was supposed to do? Anybody? It was the Civil War Amendment that was supposed to deliver citizenship to former slaves. This is why we're all in this together, because the current structure of corporations dictating who leads us and what policies we have aren't working for any of us. The Supreme Court has used the 14th Amendment 70% more for corporations than to consider equality issues for people of color in this country. But that can change too. Uh, what are your recommendations for local food distribution, supply chain solutions? Um, and it's my note from staff says, combined with green card, okay. And what about a role for community gardens in providing fresh fruits and vegetables? Uh, really important questions. You know, it's a system, so all these parts of the system are critical. Uh, local food distribution, supply chain solutions, again, this is part of the problem we're seeing is corporations are owning not just the seed and not just controlling what farmers produce and how they produce it, they're also controlling how the product travels uh, you know, they, some of them own the railroad lines and truck lines that are delivering it, the packaging and processing, and then the processed foods that are sold on the shelf to consumers. Again, you can have some of that, but you can't have folks own, owning 83% of the market and have that work. Uh, one of the ways to change that is we have to if we can find ways to have more local production, so we do need local production, we need some folks, and local can mean the region, right? It doesn't mean your next door neighbor. Um, but then we have to create ways, whether it's cooperative, whether it's private entrepreneurs that are actively engaging and recognizing themselves and changing this food chain, who become the distributors and who create supply networks. 
Uh, one of the reasons why we see certain communities having better supply networks is they, they create these cooperatives where they pool their ability, I'm talking about green grocers now, particularly in New York, who are largely Korean, they figured out how to collectivize the supply chain so they can get good fresh produce to their shelves. And that's not a bad thing. It's just they figured something out. We have to replicate that for more and more people in the distribution system so we have more and more communities having local people own those kinds of outlets. Some of that is about know-how. Some of that is about figuring out how that's done, how it's worked, and the ingredients that make it work. Some of it may require some policy change because sometimes there may be laws that are getting in the way of some of this innovation and need to be changed. Um, but the connection to, you know, to, to community gardens, so I, I think the value to community gardens is about community building. I think the, it's extremely valuable because you can't engage people in something that they're not connected to. And while everybody eats, it doesn't mean everybody understands where their food comes from or that the system is not natural uh, or fair, because most people think it is. It's a little bit invisible how unfair it's become. When people start working together, one, as I, I shared with the, the kid who is now selling produce, I mean, he's a different community actor. He's now a different kind of community leader. He's changing how he's engaging his community, but he's also understanding the food system in a totally different way that's going to make him a leader in some of the policy change we want. If we don't have that kind of community engagement at a very local level that's changing people's relationship to understanding how food is produced and how they fit into it, we can't get them thinking about some of these policy changes we need to take some of those up to scale, right? I really believe that these green shoots, that this local innovation is what gets people engaged in the wonky stuff because it's no longer wonky, it's their lives. And they understand it at a very personal level, not just an intellectual level. Um, will the new pro proposed minimum wage apply to farmers? If so, now will this change the system? Um, so the short answer is, if farmers are their own employers, no. That requires other fixes. Uh, and this is where the contracts that I was talking about with uh, large corporations comes into play. Having, because their contracts are part of their problem. Uh, but, but, what I think is important for farmers to recognize, particularly producers that want to grow organic and sell locally and grow fruit and vegetables uh, and be, be more sustainable in the system, they can't get there if, and, and therefore command a higher price and make their farms viable, they can't get there, people can't pay the prices, right? The consumer has to be able to pay that 40% increase in cost, and that only comes with an increase for, for, for workers in the system. Um, but I think it is very important to think about how farmers' lives are, are livable and viable and how they're able to provide for their families, and this is one part of that equation. Won't farms in other countries undercut American produce if everyone gets paid a fair wage here? Uh, so the short answer is uh, it depends. One of the things that ha is happening is the same way in which the corporations that are exporting food, they're actually undercutting sustainable farming in those countries they're exporting to because they're undercutting those farmers' prices. Uh, so you have countries with the absolute ability to grow their own food and feed their own people, and they're importing it. Just like we have the ability to grow fruits and vegetables, but we're importing most of it from other countries. So I think what we're saying is, and by the way, that's really bad for the environment. Okay, I know some, not everybody agrees with climate, that climate change is real, but when we're, that's a carbon footprint because what we could be selling locally and not burning up fuel to ship 3,000, 6,000 miles away, that would reduce our carbon emissions quite substantially. Um, but it's also that there are, there are folks fighting in these other countries to get these, this imported food out because they can't sustain their, because their folks are starving with our imported food. So I actually think it's not a zero sum game. I think it's actually a way that we support both our own people and we support 
our, our brothers and sisters in other countries. Uh, and there's actually a lot of effort to start to connect these efforts um, across, across countries. What are your recommendations for local food distribution? Okay, I'm sorry, I, I'm now repeating my cards. Is that all my cards? Can you speak about the role Monsanto plays in food equity? Uh, destroying it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, all right. So I'm being, uh, I mean, that's literally true. And I don't, I don't mean, I don't mean Mansa Monsanto intends it. I mean, its business model is to do it, right? Uh, I don't mean they're people who are bad. Corporations are made up of people, and people aren't bad. Uh, but again, if the interest is the shareholder, that's a different story. So the problem with Monsanto, particularly for farmers, this is a problem of intellectual property. Who owns the seed? Monsanto does. Monsanto owns the seed. But that means farmers have to pay for the seed and this is bizarre, right? Because if any of us who know anything, and I know very little about biology, my three, third grader is constantly like telling me all the things I don't know, and it's, I'm definitely not as smart as third grader. But one of the things is that Mon said, we used to own seed. If you grew your produce and your, your stuff, you know, or your wheat or your whatever it was, and it gives off seed head at the end of the season, right? And like if I'm in my backyard, I'm collecting my little seed heads, and I'm replanting them for the next season, right? Uh, not if you don't own it. That's, 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 in, that's infringement of somebody's property. That's another bizarre notion of private property that makes no sense in terms of biodiversity. It makes absolutely no sense. But when Monsanto does that, it's not, it's not working against equity in, in its own mind, right? It's just, that's just good business because then everybody has to pay them. But what it means is the small producers can't afford it. So, okay, that's the longer explanation. But the short is, like, it's destroying it. Uh, and again, that can be brought into balance. It's not that Monsanto has to go out of business. It's not that they can't own some of the seed. But no, they can't own all of it. That's restoring balance. Okay. How do we balance being able to provide healthy food for everyone with environmental sustainability when overuse of pesticides and fertilizers and farm fields like create farm drainage, wetlands, very important question, uh, and are so prevalent in food production. I mean, one, a lot of small producers aren't using this stuff. Again, remember when I talked about those contracts? Farmers are being required to use it by their contract and s with the agribusiness, and some of that is because the agribusiness is also selling them the, the fertilizer. That's why I call it sharecropping. It's like, it's not, we're not saying we will buy your product, you produce it the way you think it should be produced and we'll pay you a fair price. They're saying, no, we'll buy it, we'll tell you how much we'll pay and we'll tell you what you have to buy from us in order to produce it. That sounds like the company store to me. That makes no sense. Um, and, it's, and it works against all the things we can do to institute sustainable farming practice. But the other thing here, and I, I've had this conversation with environmentalists um, uh, internationally as well as in this country, um, population is an issue for the planet. But everything shows us that the more we invest in fairness, the more we invest in equity, the more we ensure that people are able to provide for the families, the less likely they are to have big families the more likely they are to make, because they're more empowered to make different decisions for themselves and their families. Population rates go down where there's more equity. Environmental quality goes up where democracy is stronger. And there are studies behind this, and I didn't put that in my PowerPoint, but I, I invite you to look at them, because I think the other mistake that we make is to pit making sure people are taken care of with thinking that's somehow bad for the planet. Uh, I don't think people mean that, but I think it's really important to understand the planet lives well when people live well. People steward the planet better when they're able to steward their own lives. I don't have any more questions. So thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your leadership. And thank you for all you do.
I'm afraid to use this thing. <coughs> Is this the one? Anyway, I'm just, I just wanted to say thank you all very much for coming. Thanks, Maya, very much. The work that she does uh, across the country is truly inspirational. And I think we here in North Carolina have such a, such a history of working together to, to, on these kinds of issues. Um, when you're as old as I am, you remember when this movement was an environmental movement and watching it change over the last 20 years, bringing in health and economy and farmland preservation and farmer preservation and now food justice and equity is just a truly wonderful thing. And I think, you know, Maya, if we can get this kind of thing done anywhere, we can get it done in, in North Carolina. So thanks again. Please look at the back of your program, the wonderful sponsors that we had. Thank you so much for sponsoring this um, event. Thank you to our board. Thank you very much to the committee. Lisa led the charge here on putting this all together, Charlotte. Uh, everybody involved. So thank you very much and drive safely.